Hey, everybody. So um, I was making some slight modifications to this talk on the way here um, and got so engrossed in it that I actually forgot to take my ADHD medication. Um, so writing a talk about ADHD, forgetting to take my meds, this could be really interesting. Uh, so it may go a little bit faster than it normally does. Um, so yeah, I am a developer advocate with Nexmo. Um, I'm not going to give you like the whole sales pitch. We basically we do telecommunications APIs. Um, I do want to put them up on the screen because they've been um, nice enough not only to support me in coming here to do this talk, um, but also in supporting me with the fact I have ADHD um, and supporting me in my work as well. So if you want to hear more about them, come speak to me afterwards. So this is me um, at maybe about six years old. You know, um, normally when people get diagnosed with ADHD, it's around about this time. You know, this is I think probably the only time in my childhood where I was quiet. You know, but I had a fairly normal childhood most of the time. Um, although I did grow up in the 80s, and unfortunately in the 80s, ADHD in the UK wasn't a thing. You know, it wasn't really heard of. Um, kids weren't getting diagnosed of it. You were just hi you were just a hyper kid. You were just um, talkative, or you were just too energetic or too imaginative. You know, there was no kind of mention of it being a de developmental disorder. You know, you were I was still a smart kid. How could I have some issue with my brain development if I was also smart. Um, and it's the issue that comes with ADHD is one, I'm not going to get into too much science, don't worry, but it, to understand kind of some of the things I'm going to talk about later, I think you really need to understand kind of what ADHD does to a person. And what it does is it affects our prefrontal cortex. So prefrontal cortex, I'm not a doctor, so I'm going to let this guy explain what it is instead. Hopefully the audio works. Maybe. Come on, you can do it. Oh, it's not going to play for us. Or maybe it is. The prefrontal cortex, PFC, is the cerebral cortex which covers the frontal part of the frontal lobe. The brain region that's been implicated in planning complex cognitive behaviours or personality expression, decision making and moderating social behaviour. The basic activity of the brain region is considered to be an orchestration of thoughts and actions in accordance with internal goals. The most typical psychological term for functions carried out by the prefrontal cortex area is executive function. Executive function relates to the abilities to differentiate among conflicting thoughts, determine good and bad, better and best, same and different, future consequences of current activities, working toward a defined goal, prediction of outcomes, expectations based on actions, and social control. That is, the ability to suppress urges that, if not suppressed, could lead to socially unacceptable outcomes. The frontal cortex supports concrete rule learning, while more anterior regions along the rostral caudal axis of the frontal cortex support rule learning at a higher level of abstraction. Okay, so some of the things he's talking about there, um, decision making, ability to tell good from bad, better from best, impulse control, um, the ability, like even perception of time, these are all kind of key things. You know, the ability to, to moderate your behavior, um, depending upon the context of where you're in. You know, um, well, we've all seen the code of conduct. So that's a very important skill to have. You know, and to have part of your brain be working against you, um, especially as I didn't get diagnosed till 34. You know, you have to develop skills to allow you then to really replace these things that your brain should be doing on its own. So in the, 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 the diagram up there, you actually we have um, a control brain overlaid with somebody with ADHD. And we can see the really kind of bright orange area at the front shows a difference in mass between somebody with ADHD and the prefrontal cortex of somebody with light. You know, so it is an actual developmental disorder. My brain is different to somebody who is neurotypical. And it's not all kind of doom and gloom. You know, the good part about having a mental disorder is having a valid reason for all the stupid things you do because of a damaged prefrontal cortex. So yeah, I, I, I use it sometimes to whenever I've, I've made a mistake or um, I've forgotten to do the dishes or I've lost track of time down the pub or anything else. It's like, hey, it's not me. It's my damaged prefrontal cortex. And while that can be useful in certain situations, it's not whenever it comes to career goals. You know, you read all these self-help books about like how to be successful. And I've never read one that says, be flaky, be late to everything. You know, can't, don't keep your mind on a task. These are not things that normally kind of associated with success. So I had to decide for me what, what, would be, what would be my kind of idea of success. If I, wanted to, if I wanted to say I'm a successful person, what would that look like for me, for somebody with a damaged prefrontal cortex? And it really comes down to the type of work that I do. 
So I'm a, I'm a developer advocate. Um, this, this is me working. Um, I wear swag and hand out leaflets. Um, but before that, I was an engineer. I was a senior engineer for about 15 years. So the work that I was doing was, it was work that required intense bites of focus. It was work that required creativity. It was work that was totally not designed for anybody with ADHD. But in order to, to kind of to perform that work, and, and we've got this kind of equation up on the wall here, that W equals T uh, times F. I'm very aware that it does stand uh, to WTF. Not completely unintentional. Um, but what we're saying is, you know, the high quality work, the stuff that like, I value, the stuff that I feel would make me successful, is a product of time times focus. Now, time is, is finite. You know, we only have so many hours in a day. We can't really increase time that much. You know, so if we work 10 hours in a day, but our focus is rubbish, well, then our, our amount of work produced is going to be low. If we can improve that amount of focus, you know, say, our focus starts at a one, and then we improve it to a five. Well, then we only need two hours of work to produce the same, or we only need two hours to produce the same amount of work. Um, Cal Newport describes this as deep work. Um, it's work that you need to have a high level of concentration, um, a high level of focus, uh, flow, a lot of people will regard it as. Um, but once you get into this deep work, um, then the ti your time spent on it is much more productive and you're producing much higher quality work. So this W equals T times F. So we saw in that video that one of the issues that people with ADHD have, or apparently have, it's in the name, attention deficit. You know, that we, we have a problem with, with attention. I actually don't like that term. Um, I don't think people with ADHD have a problem with attention. We have, a, we have lots of attention. We have attention going spare. We have attention for everything. You know, we have so much attention, we have no idea what we should be paying attention to. And that's where the issue comes in. It's not a, an attention disorder, it's a focus disorder. If we can channel that attention into productive work and not into Reddit comments, as often happens, but actually manage to channel it into productive work, then you know, we do have focus available. We are able to do that. Now, one more science thing. So if you have a look at this, if anybody in the audience thinks they know what it is, that's dopamine. And if you got it right and you're now sitting thinking going, yay, that little buzz that you got from being correct, that's dopamine. It's your body's or your brain's way of saying good job. You know, it's, it's what we use to, to create good behaviors and to create um, kind of our, so this is where I should take my meds, um, <laughs> to build um, kind of a, a structure for us whereby every time we do something good, it reinforces that behavior. You know, so you go to the gym, you get a little bit of dopamine. It's, it's a good thing. You know, your brain goes, hey, good job, man. Um, or you um, tick, close one of your JIRA tickets or you tick something off your to-do list. These are all times when you're going to get that dopamine hit because it's, all, it's reinforcing that good behavior. Unfortunately, um, ADHD means that you don't have as much dopamine. So you don't get that same hit. So instead, um, most of the stuff that you're doing is really based upon willpower. And willpower is a finite resource. Uh, you may have heard of the, the spoons analogy. It's normally actually used when talking about people dealing with uh, chronic pain, but can also be, um, I like it to deal with if you're dealing with willpower. You know, so you, you, have, you start the day with a dozen spoons, and every time you've got to perform a task, that takes a spoon away. You know, so getting out of bed, there's a spoon. You know, making some breakfast, there's a spoon. Remember to check your emails, remember to check your calendar, and you're giving over spoons constantly to do all these tasks. But you have a finite number of them. Now, sometimes you can borrow some spoons from tomorrow, but you've always got to pay it back, and it just means that tomorrow's going to be harder. So you've got this finite resource of willpower to work with. And you've also got a finite amount of creativity as well. It's, it's not a faucet. You can't just turn creativity on and immediately it just works. You know, you have to get into the situation where you feel comfortable in order to do this deep work, in order to, to achieve this level of focus. And if we don't have the ability to, to get into this focus, then what we end up doing is, is shallow work. And shallow work is busy work. You know, we've, we've all probably been there when you are trying to look busy, but you actually have nothing to do, or you've got something you really need to do, so you're procrastinating and doing other stuff that you don't really need to do in the effort to make yourself look like you're actually doing something. And you know, it could be sending lots of emails, it could be writing memos, it could be 
you know, on the Slack channel or God forbid setting, scheduling meetings or whatever it is. It's lots of busy work in a visible manner that makes you feel productive when you're really not being productive. And all that busy work, it, it takes effort as well. It takes willpower. It's just taking away from your finite resource that you have available. And unfortunately, this looking busy is something that, that is valued far too much in our society. You know, so here we have Nathan Hubbard. So Nathan Hubbard um, was actually, I think, maybe a VP at Twitter, so not, not an unknown kind of guy. And this is a tweet from him from over Christmas, where he's basically saying, don't be with your families, don't take time off, don't rest, be in the office. What? <laughs> like, are you really going to be productive in that extra, what, 3.8% of time that you have in the office when everybody else is at home? You know, there's, there's no work-life balance there. You know, just because you're in the office doesn't mean you're actually getting anything done. In fact, um, Jason Fried here says that workaholics aren't heroes. They don't save the day, they just use it up. You know, just because somebody's in the office for 12, 14 hours doesn't mean they're actually even productive any of that time. Because we all have a finite amount of spoons, we all have a finite amount of creativity. You can't just sit there and expect it to be working at 100% the entire time. That's not how you're going to be successful. How you're going to be successful is concentrating on the deep work and not the shallow work. Because once you start to get consumed by the shallow work, then it comes self-perpetuating. That's what you get used to doing. You know, you, you feel that that is how you're actually being productive, and you're not. You're, you're fooling yourself, you're fooling everybody else, but you're not actually getting any work done. Okay, so how do we get to the point where we can improve our situation to improve our focus, to allow us to get the best out of the finite resources that we have in our creativity and in, in our, uh, with our spoons. For me, the most important thing is working environment. So this is, this is Facebook's um, office, for anybody who doesn't know. Um, I'm, I'm getting anxious, just even the thought of trying to work there. There's just so much going on everywhere. This, these open plan offices, you know, the, and the trouble of open plan offices, is, as Dr. Nicole Miller says, is they, they're a one-size-fits-all solution that fits nobody. You know, we've got to a situation now where we think open offices are um, they're dynamic and they allow cross-team communication and they allow us to, to be more productive because they're actually removing barriers between communications and teams, which is a load of crap. Like, and we've known it for years. Really, the reason that open plan offices are popular is because they're cheap. You can fit more bodies into less space. It's not because they're more productive at all. And we've, it's not something that, that we're only now just discovering. Like, open plan offices have been around for a long time. We've done a lot of studies on them. Steelcase, um, they interviewed over 1,000 uh, office workers. 95% said that um, having somewhere private to work was important to them. Only 41% felt that they had it. 31% of them had to leave the office to get any work done. And out of that, they were losing an average of 86 minutes per day. So that's 10 working weeks a year that they were losing um, uh, out of their productivity. Canada Life, they find that if you're an open plan office, you take 70% more sick days. Queensland University of Technology's Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation find that if you're an open plan office, your levels of stress are 90% higher. You actually have higher blood pressure. You know, it has physical manifestations. The Cornell University psychologists, they just uh, took people and did a study on them where they didn't even put them in an open office. They just played the sounds of an open plan office to them for three hours and then measured the levels of um, epinephrine. So epinephrine is, is basically uh, adrenaline. So your fight or flight response. And they find that it spiked in people who were just exposed to the noise of an open plan office not even all the other rubbish that comes with it. And what they also discovered is that people who, who were played this, uh, the signs of this office were 50% less likely to make ergonomic changes to their workstations. So I'm not sure what the correlation is, but it means that you're actually 50% less likely to adjust how you work. So you're, again, you're even damaging yourself physically. And this isn't new. Like we've had open offices 1896. So this is the counting room in the Riverside Press, Cambridge, open office. 1900, the long room, which is a government life insurance HQ in Wellington, open plan office. 1902, <laughs> Howard Main Sherman, architecture and interior design in New York City, open office. In fact, we probably peaked in open offices in 1939 with Frank Lloyd White's, um, his cathedral of work. And this actually was probably the best designed open office there ever has been. Um, every table and every chair was um, hand designed to maximize the amount of uh, space that each person would have while still allowing the free flow of, of 
people between the different departments. You know, he really was working towards this idea of, of allowing um, people to, to kind of cross-pollinate between departments while still having their own workspaces. Um, and unfortunately, it, it was a, a very good design. It was Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, it's going to be a very good design. But people started copying it. And whenever you start to copy good designs, normally the clones are not as good as the original. You know, there's shortcuts are taken, and, and we end up with the, the open plan offices of the 1950s and 60s that you see in Mad Men, where it's just rows upon rows of tables. There's no um, space for anybody. It's really relegated to to the lower levels, you know. It was seen as a perk to have a private office. You know, you needed to be Don Draper if you were going to get any privacy to get any work done. Then in 1968, Henry Miller came out with the Action Office. What I think is quite interesting about this is the Action Office uh, model allows you to, to adjust your workspace to better suit the tasks at hand. You know, you've got these different dividers that you can put up to create a cubicle, to create a meeting room, to create a breakout area. And according to a friend of mine on Facebook, this is what they're now moving towards. So they currently have the like 1950s, 1960s model. They're now at 1968. You know, maybe in like another five, 10 years, they might be at a proper whole cubicle farm, get to the 1980s. We'll see how it goes. But it's 1968 Action Office, um, Randy Miller is actually based on a, um, a design for an organic workspace that came out of uh, Munich in 1965 called, and I am going to absolutely murder this pronunciation, so for any German speakers, I'm so sorry, um, Berlandschlaft, or office landscaping. Um, and it still exists today. Many of you have probably worked in offices that look like this. You know, either ones have been designed by Henry Miller or a copycat that's come from Ikea. You know, it's, they're, they're still very, very popular. Um, they did lead to the 1980s kind of style cubicle farms, but we're starting to get away from them, so it's okay. So where is this all going? So even at, at Nexmo, where I work, you know, we've, we've just redesigned our office. It still has these horrible kind of engineering um, desks, which are hideous. Um, we do have like open plan areas, and there has been some thought put into, you know, having areas for where there's going to be noise. So our, this is uh, where we hold our stand-ups, for example, um, and do our uh, scrum meetings. So they have noise-canceling curtains. And we have these little cubby holes all over the place that you can go away and hide in if you want to get some work done. There's at least been some thought put into noise isolation and uh, reducing kind of visual stimuli and allowing people to get away and have places where they can concentrate. But even with all the money they spend on building this lovely London office, that's still where I prefer to work. You know, like... That's, that's where I get my best work done. That's where I can concentrate the most. Because I control everything there. Okay, I don't get like the foosball tournaments. And I don't get like the fridge full of soft drinks, boo-hoo. You know, but here, I've, everything there is, is there for a reason that I control. Even down to like the, the second uh, laptop playing Arrow and the TV series. So I've discovered that the ADHD part of my brain is like a small child that it constantly needs distracting. So like a good parent, um, I'm raising it by plunking it in front of a TV show. Um, so while that part of my brain is currently watching RO, I'm actually free to get some work done and I can do my programming. But everything there is, is set up to benefit me. It's just, it allows me to get into that flow state. There's, no, there's nothing there that's going to cause me any kind of um, visual distraction. There's nothing there. Um, if it gets too hot, I can turn the heating on. If it, gets too, or sorry, if it gets too hot, I can open a window. If it gets too cold, I can turn the heating on. I can completely control my environment. And by giving, having that complete control and that complete autonomy, over everything, then I can remove all barriers to getting into that flow state. Because I don't want to have to exert any additional effort. I don't want to have to, to try and block out the scrum meeting that's going on across the hallway or the people that are talking about whatever was on TV last night. Any effort that I am putting into excluding those things to, to trying to like zone out those um, external stimuli is effort I'm not putting into producing good work. So the big question that always comes up is if, okay, if we let everybody work from home, are they, they're not going to get any work done. You know, how am I going to know people are working if I can't see butts in seats? And that's, that's not what management is about. This always comes from managers whenever I do this talk. You know, they want to know their staff are there. And I've, I've been a manager. I can, I can understand why that is. It's because it's really easy. You know, again, it's, it's shallow work for a manager. A manager's job shouldn't be to make sure that people are there. You know, if you want, if, if <laughs> that's what you want, get a clock in, freaking. Um, station, you know, it shouldn't be to make sure people are there. It's to make sure that one, that pe you're creating an environment that people can do their best work. That's the most important task of a manager, and that can that can mean a lot of different things. 
um, the most basic of which is making sure they have the right equipment. You know, um, I remember whenever I was first starting out in web development and job ads would have on it, you know, that you'll get a new MacBook Pro whenever you start here, you'll get a new whatever equipment. And that was just infuriating for me. That would be like going to, you know, advertising for a new fireman and going, you'll get your own hoses. Of course you're gonna need the equipment to do your job. This should not be a perk. They should just be standard. But it still needs to be said sometimes that you know, one of the things you need to do to, in order to allow people to do their best work is to provide them with good equipment. Other things might be slightly more nuanced. Um, in a team I managed, we had uh, the CEO and a couple of the other exec levels were skipping the entire kind of uh, product process and were phoning developers directly with product requests. You know, so one, they were interrupting their flow to answer the phone, and then they were, were doing a, a context shift to look at this new requirement. It wasn't getting put into any of the schedules. It wasn't getting put into the JIRA. You know, so suddenly our uh, productivity looked way down because they're working on stuff that wasn't getting tracked. And you try speaking to the exec levels about this, and you would get hand waved off because, well, they own the company. You know, who are you going to complain to? So what I did was I looked at, or I spoke to the developers and asked them, you know, so what do you use the phone for? Like apart from these calls that you get from the exec level, like do you, do you get personal calls? No, they use their own mobiles for that. Do you phone each other? And it's like, dude, these, everybody sits like here, why would I phone somebody? You know, I'll just speak to them or I'll get on chat. And it's like, anybody else in our departments? No, they'll email. So I got a big box and I walked around each desk and I put the phones in it. And I left it back at the, our IT solutions office. Because all they were were a distraction. There was no benefit to the team out of having those phones in their desk. The only thing the phones were ever used for was to interrupt them. So I removed that interruption. And there might be some other things that are even more nuanced. We had a, a, one of the team members who suddenly his productivity completely nosedived. And he just wasn't himself. And when I spoke to him, it turned out that, well, his wife had had a, had a child um, not very long before. And it turned out his, his wife had gone back to work and he changed her hours. And suddenly their childcare costs were gonna be twice what they'd budgeted for. And he wasn't sleeping at night because he's so worried about it. And all it took was to shift the times he worked around so that he could be at home whenever his wife was at work and his, so they could um, get back to a reasonable level for their childcare. And suddenly I had an employee who was happy and productive again and also a lot loyal. Okay, so we've got people working at home, we're gonna trust them to go, do good work, that's all fine. but. The one thing that always comes up um, in any kind of agency is this idea of crunch time. How do you avoid crunch time? You know, those times when you just have to turn the faucet on and you have to work all night and day and you can't uh, be worried about when focus is gonna happen because it just needs to happen there and then. So the seven Ps, it's a, it's a British army uh, saying, prior planning and preparation prevents piss per performance. This is literally the only way to prevent crunch time because crunch time just does not work. You know, so if you, if you look at the graph here, and, and this is a normal 40 hour working week, and people go, okay, well, it's crunch time, let's increase the hours to 60. And yeah, okay, that'll work in the short term. You know, you'll get this little productivity bump at the start. You know, you're, you're doing 50% more hours, so you expect to do 50% more work. And you will for the first week. But in the second week, it's down to 40. By the third week, you're at 30. You know, and somewhere in between kind of weeks four and five, you're actually, you're working more hours and getting less done. And this is normally where people kind of leave this um, whenever it's talking about productivity and the fact that crunch time doesn't work. But I did a wee bit more research and I looked into error rates. So there's other industries where they have very long working hours and, and fatigue and um, error rates are critical. So they've done a lot of studies into it, um, mostly within medical professionals and uh, within the military, because you really don't want to be making any mistakes because you're fatigued in the military. And then, so I looked at like error rates for a normal kind of 40 hour working week and it's somewhere in the region of about 20 bugs for a thousand lines of code. So I drew that in there as this is our baseline. But then I added in, okay, so we're working additional hours, so we're gonna writing more code, so our bug rate's gonna be higher. But then we're also, we're fatigued, so our rate of, our rate we're making mistakes is gonna be higher as well. In fact, it can get up to 70% higher by the time we hit reach week three or four. So if we now re-graph our productivity with our increased error rate, we can see that, okay, we're actually less productive before we even hit week four. But as well as making additional actual bugs, we're probably gonna be introducing some, some code smells, some technical debt. You know, we're gonna be maybe some bad architectural decisions or we're gonna have some hacks that are honestly just for this week and I'll definitely fix it. Um, which will be there until like at least 2023. 
Um, <laughs> and if we're if we're writing bugs and we're adding hacks and well, we're probably not writing tests, so we're not writing good enough tests anyway. Let's be honest. In crunch time, tests are probably the first thing to go. So we're going to have to go back later, and we're going to have to add those back in. And then we're not writing documentation either. You know, so now we're at the situation where actually this, you know, this where we thought we were going to be product more productive for over a month, we're barely getting an extra week out of it. And it's not that you can do this for a week, take a week break, and then do it for another week. Your recovery time from crunch period is twice as long as the crunch period itself. So if you run a like crunch for a week, you need to give you like have two weeks off before you can do it again. You know, and I, I personally would think it would be exponential growth in that, but I'm not too sure. So it comes back to this WTF thing. You know, we can't increase time, so we have to increase focus. And actually, even with that, you know, we're, we have that whole thing where even if we're still in the office for 60 hours, we're not faucets, we can't just turn it on. In a previous position before I was uh, diagnosed, I actually came into work and I sat for eight hours looking at that. I didn't take lunch, I didn't go on Reddit, I didn't go on Hacker News. I just sat and I stared at my screen. I was so burnt out, I, had, I just could not function, but I thought that if I wasn't in my seat, I was letting my team down. It, was, it had been so ingrained in me that you know, this is crunch time and everybody has to be in and we all have to be working, um, that I sat there for eight hours, unable to form a sentence, and just stared at the cursor blinking. Because I, I was, well, whatever, I was out of creativity, I was out of spins, whatever you want to call it. So you can't just add, or sorry, you can't just expect people to work more hours and be more productive. So what about we add more people? This is the graph you normally see about adding more people. You know, you've got this like little downturn um, at the bottom as you add a new team member and you've got to train them up. And then suddenly, like after the little downturn, um, you've got this increase as you become more productive having more people on the team. But if you try doing this during crunch time, this hockey stick um, really isn't a hockey stick. It's more kind of like a wet noodle. You know, so you, you add a new person, so your productivity dips. It might start recovering a little bit, but everybody's so rushed because it's crunch time that you don't get a proper chance to start training them. So instead, what happens is management goes, oh, we'll add some more people. And then you get a bigger dip as you try to train them. And then about kind of like maybe week 12, you know, you're three months in, there will be some developer who leads a charge to try and actually recover this project, and your productivity will soar until they burn out. Um, and then they probably go off sick, and your productivity goes right back down to the bottom again. And then we start over, and this is called the death march. You know, and if you get stuck in, in this on a, on a project, there's, there's not really much you can do. You know, um, the only thing you can do is avoid it in the first place. You know, this prior planning and preparation prevents piss poor performance. Okay, so we're not gonna be in a situation where we have way too many things to do and not enough time to do them. The last thing I'm gonna talk about then is routine. So routine is incredibly important for getting the flow. That's it's like this is where my routine should be, you know. So I have working periods, I have resting periods, and that's all back down to this dopamine and back down to, you know, the the idea of getting into good habits. Um, it can be difficult. So in my work, this is this is my travel schedule since January. So I've done Ireland, UK, Portugal, Canada, back to UK, to Hungary, to the UK, to America, to Dominican Republic, to America, back to the UK, to Hungary, and to here. So trying to keep that kind of schedule when that's happening is a little difficult. But it, honestly, uh, once you get past the environmental and the work balance, setting your own routine is probably the, the most important thing. So I'm running out of time. I'm now up to 28 minutes. Um, I know I've, I've got to get the next person on to get set up, so I'm going to leave it here. Um, there's a lot more to kind of talk about and things around this. Um, I have a list of reading materials that I will post on Twitter. Um, I'll actually skip forward to this tweet. So um, follow me on Twitter. I'll post links to different books and things about this. Um, I'll put up the slides as well, which has got a little bit more context on other things I was going to talk about. Um, and also, I'll be available the rest of today and tomorrow if people want to come and, and talk a little more about this. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. So we don't have much time for questions, but I'll at least ask a couple in sure, sort of rapid fire style. What do you think about a four day work week, um, about 10 hours per day? Um, so I've actually worked in a company that did a four day work week, but they didn't do 10 hour per day. It was just four regular work days. Um, and it worked really well, to be honest. Um, we got the same amount done in those four days as we would normally would achieve in five. 
Um, the only issue that I had with it is they also mapped it to the um, the sprints for um, like our uh, development sprints. So your sprint then was four days long, um, which I felt was slightly too short, but the actual amount of focus and amount of uh, productivity, even having only seven and a half hours um, per day, was the same as what we'd have in five. Work tends to grow to fit the space available. Sounds good to me. Um, when you need to focus and isolate yourself, sudden requests from other colleagues interrupt you and it can be very distractive. How do you fight that? Um, make sure your communication is uh, asynchronous. So we use Slack an awful lot for communicating and work, um, which I know is a chat program and you expect it to be synchronous. But if you use um, lots of channels and lots of threads and turn your notifications off, then you can come back later and dip back in and, and see what was discussed. Uh, it, it is a bit of a, a change within a team to, for people to, to get to the point where they understand that just because they have a question right now doesn't mean they're going to get an answer right now. But once you kind of make that cultural change, um, it's, it's a lot more beneficial for everybody. It also means as well that you can then think about some of the, the more nuanced issues that may come from something. And maybe it it's, doesn't need a Slack comment. Maybe this actually needs a, a long form email or you know, it gives you that time to really think about what's being asked as well. Uh, last question. In the corporation um, I worked at, a standard practice for avoiding distraction was putting headphones on and listening to music. Have you ever tried this approach? So I have a, a pair of uh, noise cancelling, active noise cancelling headphones, and they're great um, if all you get distracted by is audio. Um, but that's, you also have visual distractions. You have people just like walking up and tapping your shoulder and go, hey, how was your weekend? You know, if you're sitting in the office just having headphones on, I know it's a universal symbol of don't bother me, um, but there might at times that that doesn't really occur or that somebody thinks, well, this is definitely urgent and I should bother you for this. Or, you know, there's donuts in the kitchen. Do you want one? Like, what? Um, you know, the headphones, they're a good starting point, but they're, they're not a magic bullet. They're not a silver bullet.